Well, good morning. It was really an honor to be uh, asked to participate in this uh, symposium to honor Nigel. I'll just tell a brief story related to Nigel, and that is when I was recruited to Michigan State, I told the chairman of another uh, institution where I was considering going, I was coming to Michigan State, and he said, you need to think about this. You're going to ruin your career. <laughs> but he didn't know about Nigel. <laughs> which was one of the best things that ever ha happened to me in my career. Uh, this topic may not seem uh, very epidemiology related, but in fact, it stems directly from my interest in the outcomes of, of extremely premature babies and what was at least at this time and still uh, in, when I was at Michigan State and still somewhat what I consider to be the total chaos of the outcome literature, where you can look at the outcomes of premature babies and find a study that says just about anything and in terms of the prevalence of uh, severe disability. And I was concerned about the effect that was having on decision making in the newborn intensive care unit. Oh, this is the wrong slide, but that's okay. Um, this uh, is a uh, survey that was done of, uh, of the section of uh, perinatal pediatrics, the AAP, that asked uh, neonatologists about whether or not it was legal or uh, whether it was not legal or, and not ethical to withhold withdrawal therapy at uh, 20 weeks. And this was in the uh, early uh, 2000s, but uh, I, I think it's remarkable what the, that so many people, um, so many neonatologists felt this way. I have another slide that I won't show that shows the distribution of neonatologists in Northeastern United States that looked at the lowest gestational age at which they were willing to give intensive care and the highest gestational age at which they were willing to withdraw intensive care. And there was a several week, week spread. Uh, and I, I thought this was a problem. So is this kind of variation in which treatment op options are considered legal or ethical? Is it, is it understandable? And is it ethically acceptable? Well, to understand it, I think we have to take just a few moments to look at the considerations that are relevant to whether or not intensive care should be offered to extremely premature babies. The ones we'll talk about because of time limits are in orange. The other ones, uh, not only don't we have time, we also don't have a lot of data. We wrote a uh, large grant to look at some of these parts when I was here in Nigel, and the reviewers said, this is a great idea, but it can't be done. So it wasn't funded. So skip that one. So this is an outcome of extreme prematurity from the neonatal uh, research network from the NICHD. And you can see uh, well, first of all, let me say that the strength of this study is the, the number of babies, very large cohort, and also the follow-up rate. The weaknesses of the study, as we'll see, is the age at, at follow-up. But you can see here that the uh, increase in, decrease in, in mortality with each week of gestational age is substantial. Um, so I presented this data a little different than we usually do as if you've got 100 babies, how many are going to survive or die? How many will survive with severe disability? How many will survive without severe disability? Because I think it uh, highlights something, and that is the not only the remarkable increase in survival with each week of gestational age, but also the uh, increase in survival without severe disability with each week of gestational age, while at the same time, the prevalence among, survive, among uh, live births that survivor severe disability really doesn't change that much from week to week of gestational age. Now, what's not shown here is the confidence levels of these estimates, which are fairly wide. And there was significant um, variation among the centers in the ASHD network. The other thing that's, that you have to remember is that we talk about 22 weeks, 23 weeks, 24 weeks. We don't have any idea. Basically, I mean, at early in gestation, our best estimates in the absence of artificial reproductive uh, technology is about five days. You get up towards the second trimester and you're talking about a 10 to two week day. So you're talking about wide confidence intervals in the estimates and you're talking about wide variation in what the actual gestational age is. 
It always kills me when obstetricians start talking about 22 weeks and two days, like they know. <laughs> so you can see that, you know, there may be some variation in where you think it's justified to withhold or offer intensive care at what gestational age. But then you look at the LGN data. Um, this is a fairly large cohort uh, that Michael's already described to you. The um, main strength of this study is the age of follow-up is 10 years. Now, because of that, a major weakness is the follow-up rate, which did introduce possibility of, of some bias because the, those followed up were of higher socioeconomic status than those who were lost to follow-up. But you can see that um, compared to two years of age, there is a substantial reduction in the prevalence of profound and moderate severe disability and the increase in the proportion of survivors that have no or mild disability. So are you reading about two-year follow-up? Are you reading about 10-year follow-up? You know, there's problems with this data. There's problems with the early follow-up. It's, it's hard to know. And this doesn't begin to touch upon the variation that's, that's in the literature. These are relevant ethical principles and they seem, you know, pretty much straightforward. They're not. Uh, just for example, you know, the best interest standard, there's still a lot of controversy about whether or not it's only the best interest of the newborn that should be taken into consideration or should anybody else's interest be considered. Um, the United States government has taken a fall, strong, very, it's so the AP, a strong stance that it should be only the infants. It doesn't really make sense though. I mean, none of us would make decisions about ourselves without considerations of our family and things. So to exclude those considerations, it's important because of the vulnerableness of, of uh, babies and disabled patient, persons, but to totally exclude anybody else's interest is, uh, I, I don't think, uh, reasonable, but it's still very controversial. Paternal autonomy, I'm always amused at medical students when I talk about it, they think parents can do anything they want with their children, they can't. Uh, sanctity of life, the, the big issue is whether or not we're talking about biologic life, we're talking about personal life. So these issues that are, you know, we roll off our tongues are uh, a little more complex when it comes to applying them. Distributive justice, nobody wants to talk about that in the United States unless it's somebody else. Nobody want, we don't want anybody to tell us we can't have some medical therapy. So I think given the complexity of these data and these uh, values, oh, and the other thing is that sometimes you can't make a decision. Whatever decision you make is going to conflict with one of these values. So you have to, these values have to be prioritized and people prioritize them differently. So it might be understandable. There's some variation among the neonatologists. Um, is it acceptable? And I, I'd say that if the variation among physicians about what's legal or ethical in providing care to premature babies results in the variation of treatment options that parents are offered prenatally, that then the range of options that an individual parent gets under similar, similar clinical circumstances is a function of the physician's personal beliefs and values. And that is not acceptable. So are there roles for the community and physicians in treatment decisions for extremely premature infants? Obviously, I think so. Now, I'm gonna go through the, the premises I make in making this argument for these roles. And we don't have time to defend them. You just have to accept that this is what I'm, the premises I'm making in coming to these conclusions. Society has a personal obligation to preserve and promote personal life. Society has an obligation to distribute shared, limited resources justly. Extremely premature infants have a finite human right, human right to the extent that they have the potential to become persons, not that they are persons, but the potential to become persons. Physicians ought not to impose their own personal values on parents, but physicians ought not to be compelled to implement treatment decisions that they in good conscience cannot do so. Parents are appropriate 
surrogates for treatment decisions involving non-autonomous uh, children. And they have broad but not unlimited discretion. And parent autonomy ought to be limited only when the decisions clearly conflict with the best interest of the child and or the interest of the community as a whole. So how do we recognize, reconcile these differences in defining the roles of a community physician and parents? Um, most people don't wanna think about the community having any role in the decisions that they can make uh, regarding uh, medical care. So the community needs to establish as difficult as it might be for itself and its members informed, considered, and respectful boundaries of morally defensible trade-offs in balancing the competing interests of the community, parents, and non-autonomous children. And this is a model that conceptually uh, I think about, and, and that is it, the uh, x-axis shows the benefit burden going from none to infinite. The x-axis are the right of the infants to treatment, parental discretion, and the physician's obligation to forgo or to provide treatment. And it's a benefit uh, burden ratio, ratio increases from none. We get to an area where there, there is some right, right to treatment. There's some obligation of the treatment of the physician to provide it, but the parent has a broad discretion. And as the benefit burden increases, uh, it gets to the point where now the infant's, infant's absolute right to treatment is absolute, Prep, uh, parental discretion is limited, and the, and the physician has the obligation to treat. Notice I made, meant to make these, these boundaries uh, fuzzy because of all the uncertainties that we talked about. So what's the will of physician? So they should be guiding the application of these boundaries based on the individual case. So you should knowledgeably and objectively estimate patient-centered, not exclusively, patient-centered benefit burden of treatment based on specific circumstances of the individual infant and determine whether this benefit burden is within the community's morally defensible boundaries, which make their parent discretion, decisions discretionary. If intensive care is discretionary, discretionary, uh, they should inform the parents of the benefit and burdens of providing and withholding intensive care, assist parents in choosing the option that's most consistent with their own values. But if they can't in good conscience implement the treatment decision, transfer the care to another physician who is willing uh, to do so. And the role of parents is to base their decisions for the infant on their own values and benefit burdens and treatment alternatives, giving due discretion to the best interest of their infant. Thank you.